Hey guys, it's Mark Holthy here, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher, welcoming you back to another live immigration Q&A. It is awesome. I've got some really good news, and there's going to be some changes happening on the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel. And one of those changes is that I'm going to switch the format of these live Q&As. So I've been learning a lot about how to just create better information for all of you. And one of the ways is to separate out what I'm teaching, which I am going to do some teaching at the beginning here. We're going to talk about some great news that has been announced for people who are in Canada who are out of status. And you know who you are. Maybe a work, per work permit couldn't be extended. You weren't sure what to do. Your work permit expired because of the pandemic. Or maybe you're a student. You were struggling with your ability to to go back to school or there was just a whole host of problems. Maybe you couldn't afford the tuition because you couldn't work. You were, you were laid off. And so all of these people that are in this really narrow um, area because of the pandemic, there's been some really good news that I'm going to share with you. Um, welcome. It's great as always to have everybody connecting. I, um, let's see who we have here tuning in. So we've got Arjun here. As always, make sure guys that when you are connecting in with me here, that you um, definitely, definitely uh, put in where you're listening from. So I want to see where you're, where you're tuning in from. We've got our, our consistent, faithful, faithful folks here. We've got Ralph, who is always here. And uh, it's awesome to have you, Ralph. I appreciate your support. Uh, we've got Victor tuning in here. Um, and of course, everybody knows Ralph. You're up in Edmonton. Great to have you. We've got people tuning in on the Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel as well as the Facebook page, and that's awesome. There are others that are watching on Periscope through Twitter and on our Express Entry Law private Facebook group. Those of you who are in the private group, remember, if you're posting comments, I won't be able to see your profile uh, just because of the restrictions that, that Facebook has. So slide over to the Canadian Immigration Institute Facebook page, and you will have an opportunity to actually get your image just like Ralph uh, connected up here and we've got Muhammad and we've got Omar. He says, Hey, I hope you're okay. I'm doing fantastic. I'm doing awesome. I could not be better. I've never been busier and I'm trying to get away next week. Remember, I'm going to be away on holiday, so I won't be able to do these live Q and A's for all of you next week. Cause I'm just taking some much needed time. But, um, but so I've been cramming in everything I possibly can uh, to, to make use of every ounce of time to make sure I'm meeting my client's expectations and all those kinds of things and just doing tons of consults and everything that I love, which is practicing immigration law. All right, um, let's keep going forward here. So, oh, Diego's down in Acapulco. That's awesome. Very cool, Diego. I think that's awesome. All right, let's see where ever, everyone else is tuning in from. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Victor says, where can I get the fixed rate for calculating my proof of funds? And you're going to see today, it's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to answer a few questions. I'm going to show you some good news in just a little bit here while we're waiting for everybody to, to, to jump on. I don't want people to fail to hear this good news if you're in Canada. Um, so I'm just giving everybody just a little bit of time. So Victor, I'm going to get to that in just a second. I will come back to you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sai is in India. Great to have you, Sai. Uh, Ravinder, good to have you. Excellent. And you can see we've got Facebook and we've got YouTube. Uh, Sabia is in Islamabad. We've got T in Edinburgh. Welcome back, T. Great to have you. Uh, let's see. Fayaz is over in Montreal. This is great. <laughs> All right. Vanille says, appreciate your patience in answering questions and queries. Hey guys, I love doing this. The problem that I have is I don't have time enough to answer everyone's question, but I have a little solution that I'm also going to be announcing that I'm going to do that's going to revolutionize the way I'm doing these videos. Sandeep, hello. Victor down in Venezuela. Good to have you here, Victor. Awesome. Uh, let's see. We've got um, Nofal is in Qatar. Uh, Nag Nagarjuna is in Toronto. Welcome. We've got some more Indian representation from, uh, from Saksham. And Saki is over in India. We've got Meena. Good to see you, Meena. Awesome. In Mississauga with a super big smiley face. Fantastic. We've got a Facebook user, 
who's tuning in from Saudi Arabia. Very cool, Jetta. I love this. This is awesome. Kartik, thank you from Dubai. He says he, he thinks that the live stream, the videos are great. Fantastic. That's awesome. Let's see who else we've got. We've got Nithin in Dubai. We've got Christian down in South America, Lima, Peru. Awesome. Uh, Tahir, I'll give you a hello too, my friend. All right. Okay. Sandeep says his postgrad work permit has expired and he has an active profile. Oh, Sandeep, listen up. There will be some news for you today. Um, Bernard's over in Boston, but from Lebanon, welcome. We've got a ton of people down in the U.S. looking north to the great white north to, uh, to explore their options of staying in North America. Sunith is in India. Uh, Liliana, big shout out to you again in Germany. 37 degrees. That is so hot. <laughs> wow. Nice. We got someone on the Express Entry Law private Facebook group, Tijuana, watching from Tijuana. Very cool. Okay. And uh, this person says, really, really um, much needed to hear this news. Okay. Starbucks says, we'll miss you next week. I'll miss all of you guys, but much needed time away with my family. Grobs up in Edmonton. Uh, we've got uh, Harpinder is in Punjab. Tahir is Pakistan. Anwar's in Bangladesh. Rami, Egypt. One day, Rami, I'm going to get there. My trip with my wife was canceled. So unfortunately, we weren't able to go there like many of you because of the pandemic. And there's just a very, very large group of people that are tuning in. Okay, I want to switch gears. And what I want to do right now is I want it. I want to address something that's really neat that uh, that happened. If you guys remember, I think it was a week ago, someone asked a question about federal skilled trade program. And they said, when is it going to happen? And I said, for sure, we're going to have another draw. For sure we are. And I'm going to flip my screen over a little bit here so you guys can see it a little bit better. But for sure, we're going to have another draw before the end of the year. Absolutely. And what happened on February the 6th, you guys can see right here, Federal skilled trade. Now, understand this program is for trade level people, your welders, your electricians, your carpenters, pipe fitters, those type of people who traditionally don't have the education to get them the points they need. So the federal skilled trade program was created to give a pathway for them. And what happened? You can see right here, the number of invitations, 250 were issued and the score was 415. So that just happened, and it's not a lot. Usually they do 500, but I guess for whatever purposes at this stage, maybe there wasn't that many candidates, although this, the pass mark was pretty high. We've seen it for the Federal Skilled Trade Program going down almost to 300, but 415 was where they decided to draw the line. Maybe there'll be another one. We just don't know, but Federal Skilled Trade Program is getting in the game. So... Cool. Now we'll see what's going to happen. If we look at the previous rounds of invitations here and we look at what's happened in the past, before that, we had the no program specific. Okay. Then before that, we had the Canadian experience class. Before that, it was the PNP. Are you guys seeing, a, are you seeing a trend here? No specific right here, July 8th. Then we go here, Canadian experience class. Then we go here, PNP. So you can watch the video and maybe I'll post it in the link here on Express Entry is now starting rotating draws. So we could very well see. Now, whether there's another federal skilled uh, trade program announced, that, that's to be seen. But we are starting to see this rotation. So it gives hope for people in Canada who are stuck and can't reach the high, high levels that exist in the program, the, the, the no specific program draws. 476 was the last draw, and I suspect it's going to remain right around that range for the foreseeable future. But the CEC guys have hope that, okay, with the CEC rounds, we know that the scores are lower. So they're about 445 was when the last one was. And then those outside of Canada, well, at least now you know that they are doing draws, which is great. And then you have the PNPs. Well, if you can get a PNP nomination, you're good as gold. And big shout out to all of the candidates. I think I have five or six right now um, alone that are going through the OINP's human capital priority stream who were, who were drawn on the recent uh, targeted draw for IT. So huge shout out for them because 600 points, bam, you're in. You're good as gold. All right. Now I'm going to shift over here and I want to share what 
is the cool news. Now, it's not the most breaking news because today is, what is today? I can never remember what the dates are. I've got so much going on. Today is, oh, I can't even see my phone. I don't even know what day it is today. <laughs> Let's see. Is there anywhere here? Oh, I don't know what day it is. I don't know. Anyways, it's <laughs> the 14th is when this news came out. And, um, and this is the coolest thing. Big shout out to IRCC. This is where the government is genuinely caring about people. You look to the South. You look to the States. My goodness, you know, if you aren't providing a direct support to someone, if you're not in class as a student, if you're if you're work, if you're laid off, all, all of these issues, the U.S. immigration are not super compassionate. But on the Canadian side, our Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, our department is awesome. And what they've done here, you'll see, is that normally when you have an expired work permit, study permit, or a visitor, you have 90 days after that document has expired to restore your status. And if you don't get it in before that time, then you are hooped. In other words, you're gonna have a real hard time um, staying in Canada. Now, we have some strategies. There's temporary resident permits and other things to try to overcome that. But, but generally speaking, it is not easy. And so what has the government done? Well, look at this. So, and I'm going to highlight this as we go. During the pandemic, temporary residents, that's the workers, students, and visitors who remain in Canada, have been encouraged to renew their work permits and maintain their legal status in Canada. Of course, you know, we don't want people running around with no status being illegal in Canada. And so, but the pandemic has impacted on the ability of these people um, to provide complete applications. So maybe you can't get a document. Maybe your passport can't be renewed. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that you're not able to get often that are essential for these processes to extend your status um, that are not your fault. And so um, IRCC, whoops, I'll close that off. So basically it says here, in addition, many temporary residents have had difficulty finding flights home with air travel limited around the world. So you can't extend, you can't go home you're in a rough spot. You're in a really rough spot. So what's going to happen? Well, once again, huge shout out to IRCC. As a result of the pandemic and its associated challenges, a new public policy has been implemented that provides an extension to applying for restoration. And here's the key, guys. Look at this. Beyond the current 90-day time frame for foreign nationals in Canada. So what this means that is that former workers, students or visitors whose status expired. Now, this is the most awesome thing at all. They went back all the way right there, a big January, whose, student, whose status expired, you can see, after January the 30th. Well, when did, when did everything blow up in Canada? It was around March the 30th, or sorry, March 18th is kind of when things started really shutting down. But they're going back to people. Anyone whose status expired after January the 30th and who remained in Canada will now have until, what is this? Look at this. December the 31st of this year to apply to restore their status provided you meet the requirements for the type of status and authorization that you're applying to restore. So big shout out, great news. And I want to finish off with even a bigger, massive benefit that comes from this. Check this out. Those of you whose work permits have expired, you are, and actually I'm dealing with a client right now and it breaks my heart because the consultant went and told them to go down to the border and do a flagpole and get their work permit extended or to get their new work permit. And what happened? Well, they're now in a battle that I'm fighting for them to try to keep them here, notwithstanding the fact the border wants them to leave and depart Canada. Here's what I want to show you. The public policy allows former work permit holders, that's all of you with work permits that have expired, to apply for an employer-specific work permit to work while a decision on your restora restoration application is pending. So here's the key though, okay? So if you have a job offer, so you're out of status, your work permit's expired, but now you have an employer who says, I can get a labor market impact assessment for you. I want to hire you. 
this is the cool thing. Job offer and you submit a work application right here that is supported by a labor market impact assessment or an exempt offer of employment. So the key is it's an employer specific work permit. Some of you, for instance, that are maybe Francophone speakers, French speakers, there are the Francophone program allows your employer to be able to hire you without getting a labor market impact assessment. And these types of work permits, what it means here is that you just have to notify IRCC through the process set up for eligible foreign nationals, but you can actually start working before the work permit is approved. So what amazing news Massive shout out to immigration. Some days you're just super proud of the country that you live in, the immigration program that you have a privilege of being a part of, and that's me. So big shout out, fantastic. So great news. I wanted to let everybody know about that. We're going to do one of these for the government. Massive applause for the government, which is super cheesy, but who cares? I can do whatever I want. I could also give them a bicycle horn if I wanted to. <laughs> but the reality is great news. And so if you are one of those individuals that's kind of stuck, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, contact our firm. We can help you to, to navigate your way through this. Um, but I'm probably going to do some videos on it. So let's answer some questions. Then I'm going to talk about some changes that I'm going to do to the channel that are going to benefit all of you guys. All right. Let's go through here and let's see what we've got here. Um, Vidya says, hey, Mark, can you tell what can be expected CRS score in the future? Okay, well, like I said, it's Canadian experience class, I don't think it's going to drop below 440. At least I don't. The reason it dropped down to 431 before was because no one could get language tests. The, the language testing centers were closed. People couldn't get educational credential assessments. And so no new people were coming into the pool. That's why it was able to drop down to that 431. So I'm thinking probably around, you know, maybe 440 might be the lowest, but probably 440 to 445 is kind of the range for CEC only. For you guys that are federal skilled workers, outland, overseas applicants, I'm thinking that it's probably going to be in the mid 470s. Now, we saw 476 was the last one. It could come down to 474, 473, 470, 472, but I personally don't think it's going to drop below 470. Anything's possible, but really, if you want to qualify on human capital alone, I think the scores are going to be around 470. And what does that mean? Well, if you are a candidate that's 29 years old, you have a master's degree, you have three years, okay, three years of skilled work experience abroad, and you have a CLB9, which means eight in listening, seven in speaking, writing, and reading, well, your score is 469. So what does that mean? Well, one of those abilities, you need to do a little bit more. And that's even to cross over the 470. So that's how competitive we are. Heavily, heavily weighted to people with experience in Canada. What else do you do? Well, I don't want to get into a big, long, drawn-out explanation. I'm going to do a separate video on this. But maybe you learn French, right? Maybe you pick up another language. Maybe you need another, um, well, with a master's degree, all you can improve for education is PhD. And most times, once you hit 30 years old, then you're losing five points. You guys get the picture. And then with the other programs, the federal skilled trade, well, obviously it's right around 400, right? Okay, good question. All right, uh, Rajat says, hey, I have a question. The university currently are not giving transcripts due to the ongoing pandemic. Is there an alternative to get the ECA done? Nope, you are stuck, my friend. Um, there are certain things that will allow people to, to just wait, but when it comes to filing your EAPR, you know, well, really, when it comes to submitting your profile, you're not going to be able to do it unless you can actually give your credentials to the Educational Credential Assessment Agencies like WES and ICAS and all of those. So, unfortunately, there is no workaround with that. Okay, uh, Anisha, big shout out to you. I'm doing great. Thank you. Nat, uh, Nafis is in Bangladesh. Wonderful. We've got Anwar, Bangladesh. We've got Alejandro in Bolivia. Julius is in BC, Arjun's in Canada, we've got um, Alan S is over in Turkey, South Africa, this is so cool. Who would have believed that someone, an immigration lawyer sitting in their home in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. Personally, I think it's the center of the world, but others beg to differ. 
Um, <laughs> but who would have expected that people all over the world would be connecting in such a meaningful way? We're a big, massive family. And that's what I love most about this. All right, let's see. We've got a question here from Ajay. And Ajay says, now I checked my medical exam sheet and it says, I am non-EDE. Can this be a problem and render my application as incomplete? Please need your input. I just talked with a client about this yesterday. There's workers. Um, understand there, the non-EDE means ex excessive demand exempt. That's what EDE means. And you guys, when you're going to get your upfront medicals, not all panel physicians are created equally. All right, not all, not all of them are. But when you go in, you're emphasizing to them that the medical is for the purposes of immigration. Okay, when they go through the process, you will see that the vast majority of medicals indicate worker or visitor or something like that. You cannot be held responsible for that. I have seen on the internet and I've seen other people posting that there were refused applications because the medical wasn't the right one. Oh my goodness. If you as an individual had a representative that did not fight the government on that, then you hired the wrong rep. And this is another reason why hiring an immigration lawyer is to your benefit. Because I wouldn't just accept that. Oh no. If you went to a panel physician, you dutifully did everything that was asked and they issued an immigration medical that somehow IRCC didn't accept because it was for a wrong purpose. Oh my goodness. That, I would challenge that 100%. I would request reconsideration. If that wasn't successful, we'd go to federal court. Because you cannot be held responsible when you're doing everything that you can, when it's the government's own panel physicians. We're not talking about some foreign police authority that's issuing a, a police certificate that's improper and not accepted by IRCC. We're talking about medicals here. And so, yeah, I would fight it. So my position with medicals, if you've genuinely gone, explained things to the panel physician, they've dutifully issued you the e-medical information sheet, you can rely on, a, you can rely on that. And... Someone may come back and say, well, that's just for a worker. It should be coded as an immigrant. Well, screw that. I would challenge it. So I would not worry about it. I don't stress about it with my clients. Fighting with a panel physician to get the wording changed on an on e medical information sheet, not my ball of wax. I won't do it. But the reality is I will hold immigration to honoring it, right? Medical's a medical. All right. Okay. Minaz is over in Toronto. Cindy, great to see you. Okay. Uh, Jalaj says, when FSW draws will happen for people outside Canada. Okay, well, we've just talked about this. Let's flip back here to, uh, to the site. We're going to go back to the rounds of invitations. Let's take a look here. So the last open program, no specific, right here was August the 5th. All right, so if we take August the 5th and then we shift down here, we look, we have a Canadian experience class, then we have a PNP. So it's possible we could have a PNP and a CEC before we get back to another one. August the 5th, maybe they only do one per month. Maybe the next one we're gonna see is in September. It would not be unrealistic to believe that. So I'm probably gonna guess early September before we see another Outland application. But like I said, I'm guessing like you guys. I'm prognosticating like you guys are. Isn't it fun though? It's really fun. Especially when I said there's gonna be another FS. Uh, uh, FST, a trade draw, and boom, <laughs> there was. Very cool. I'm almost positive immigration is not listening to me though. So no, they don't, they don't care what Mark's doing. But I'm sure they care when Mark is saying, you guys are awesome because big shout out to them with this change to the restoration policy. So, so cool. All right, let's go see what we've got here uh, for some other questions. Okay. Um, all right, so this is... Uh, Syed says, okay, I'm from, um, I'm from India, Bangalore, the Silicon Valley. Very cool. Looking for the best options for immigration. I'm 45 with 18 years in security infrastructure. All right, so this is where I do right this. I ring the bell. And that means, Syed, go over to our firm website and book a consult and we can go through this in detail. I think you guys know by now, when it comes to assessing whether or not someone actually qualifies for immigration, well, wow, that's going to take a lot more information than just what comes in the feed of a live YouTube stream. So go here, click on the start here button and fill out our intake form and we will get you whipped into a, cons into a consult right away, super quick. And then we can go over in detail 
uh, exactly, Syed, your situation and, and all of the possibilities that may or may not exist. And the best part of these consults, guys, whether you have, whether you think you have a super, super rock solid chance or whether you're unsure, knowing that you have no chance is just as important as knowing that you have a pathway forward. And lots of people will pursue with this hope that yes, it's going to work out. And I've seen so many overseas agents, so many overseas consultants that will say to someone, yes, you can apply to Express Entry. Look, you're, el you're eligible. We can help you to get your profile in the pool. And then guess what happens? The person sitting at 330 points, they don't have a knock code that's even remotely close to one that a province might give you a notification of interest on. And they're basically stealing their money. They're basically taking their money knowing they have no hope. And if you're a representative by now, lawyer, consultant, I don't care who you are, and you're taking money from people to submit profiles, and you do not know how the invitations to apply, the rounds of invitations work, then freak, you should not be practicing immigration because your important role is to tell that person, I'm sorry, you don't have a chance, and I would not feel proper taking your money to submit a profile where you have zero chance of success. That is the issue. That's how I see it. All right? Okay, great question. Let's whip through some more. Um, we've got Hardik here in India. Great to have you. Uh, we've got Anisha in Brampton. Biggie's over in Kiz uh, Kyrgyzstan. Cool, awesome. Karen in India. Another Kurdistan. Fies. Hey, that's awesome. We got like a double whammy here of, of Kurdistan's there. Well, actually, I stand correct. My mistake. We've got Kyrgyz, <laughs> Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz, Kyrgyzstan, maybe. Kyrgyzstan and Kurdistan, Iraq. Two very different. So cool. So cool. All right, Harpinder, you can see what's up, man. I'm up. This is so awesome. All right, let's keep whipping through these. We've got so many comments, but I'm going to pound through these. We've got our India representation. We've got Toronto. Welcome. And I love this. Gerline says, Mike, how are you doing? I don't know who Mike is, but if you're referring to Mark, I'm doing fantastic. All right, let's see who else we've got here. I'm now shout out to you again. We've got a Facebook user who's probably watching on the Express Entry Law private Facebook group. Go over there, guys. If you've got questions about immigration, there's almost 125,000 people all seeking that immigration dream to Canada. All right. Yeah, Amna, you're over in Toronto. Welcome, welcome. Okay, T says, hey, if I get a job offer after getting an ITA, what do I do next? Don't worry about it. Who cares? If you've already received your invitation to apply and you've got this job offer, you're already in the pool. Obviously, if the job offer, if you're outside of Canada, relates to you being able to come and work, then pursue the work permit while your, your um, EAPR is being processed. If you're in Canada, whatever, pursue the work permit, right? But it doesn't impact uh, anything after that other than maybe updating what you're doing. Okay. Uh, all right. Najib is over in uh, Kenya. Great to have you. Wow. We've got a great group of people here. Okay. Let's see. This one is Rajat and he says, Hey Mark, I had a question. The university currently are not giving transcripts due to, yep. I answered that one. Rajat got two shout outs. <laughs> Don't double post you guys. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Gertie says, Hey, I've got a question. Is IRCC processing paper applications for PR? The answer is no. At least maybe a little bit. <laughs> maybe they're processing a little bit. Here's what's happening. With social distancing still in place in Canada and overseas, the officers just can't get in in the way they could before, all crammed together in the visa office, pumping away processing paper applications. They can't. But they've started this pilot with officers to allow them to, um, to um, basically scan all of the paper-based applications in so that they can start processing. So when it comes to IRCC, paper applications for PR, there might be just a tiny few that are started, but generally speaking, there's nothing happening until these social restrictions, these distancing uh, is lifted. Okay, Ajay says, my medical exam report doesn't have an IME number, but completeness check says must have IME number. Can this render my application incomplete? That doesn't make any sense. Your e-medical most definitely should have an IME number. And this is another one asking about medicals. Go back to the doc and say, what's up? Why is there no IME number on it? Maybe they have a reasonable explanation, but I generally 
yes, like to have that number on there with a barcode because that is what's being tracked to match up your application with this immigration. Here, picture it this way, guys. Hundreds of thousands of people are doing immigration medicals. They all go into these big vats of, of immigration medicals. They're just dumped in, dumped in. How in the world is immigration going to match up your application with the one that's in their system? How? With an IME. And that's how they're able to track it and to pull it out of that big, massive pool. So, Ajay, that could be an issue. If you have any questions, once again, I can take a look at it and see if, if, if maybe you're overlooking something. Um, you don't hesitate to book a consult. Happy to guide you through whatever you need help with. But that's one I would kind of look into. All right. Jeevan says, hey, my passport is newly renewed and it doesn't have any stamps. Do I need to upload only the new passport or should I include my old passport as well? The answer is, drum roll. Actually, do I have something? I don't even know if I... Well, that wasn't a very good sound effect. <laughs> the answer is, immigration tells you to provide a copy of your current travel document as well as any stamped pages. They don't say anything about an old passport. And the reason I tell you, no, you don't, is for that exact reason. Now, is it possible that they come back and ask for copies of your old passport? I guess they could, but understand, I'll let you guys in on something. The days of requiring old passports to look at stamp pages are like, bye-bye, gone. Why did they need them in the beginning? And this is the problem with relying on information from the internet or representatives who don't do their homework, who don't, under, don't understand the law, who don't go out of their way to do anything other than read the government website. And they don't even read the act or the regulations or the program delivery instructions. It all comes down to police certificates. And a few years back, they required you to provide a police certificate for every country that you lived in cumulatively, that's all together over the past 10 years that amounted to six months. So now that rule says you provide police certificates for countries you've lived in for six months in a row within the last 10 years. Before, it was cumulative. So how do they factor in this cumulative calculation, adding up all the days? By looking at your passport stamps. And then if you didn't calculate your days properly, Guess what IRCC did? This is in the days when they were jerks. And to some extent, there are still some aspects of what they do that's kind of jerkish. But in those days, the officer would say, oh, you've got six months and one day in Kurdistan. Well, your application is going to get returned. I'm sorry, because you didn't provide a police certificate. So then, yeah, overseas agents and consultants were freaking out because all their because they never reviewed the actual dates in the person's passport. Heck no, that would be too much work. And then all of their clients were getting their applications returned. Well, that's how you learn as an uneducated consultant or, or agent, or even for that matter, lawyers who are dabbling, who don't have the background. And I said that just as a shout out because the consultants are whining now because I'm, I'm disparaging them. And, and I will repeat again, there are some excellent consultants out there, but they are, there are a massive number of completely incompetent consultants who are representing you. And why do I call them that? Because I see 30% of my consults every single day, people that are using a consultant right now who are contacting me for a second opinion, who are describing what is happening, and it is a nightmare. Now, with that being said, and this is another time where I'm going to qualify what I say, I'm really hoping that the Queen's program for the new consultants that come in is going to elevate the bar. But it was a joke to become a consultant. What it took to become a consultant was so low that pretty much anybody who wants to be one. In fact, I just got a call from my cousin in Calgary. Another school is opening up, opening, opening up programs to pump in a whole bunch more people for the last six months before the program is shut down and it then becomes governed by Queens. And the other issue I have, if you consultants really want me to stop uh, slamming you, well then I want you to petition for no grandfathering. In other words, if you want to continue to practice as an immigration consultant, then go get the proper training that Queens Law is going to offer you so that you're actually prepared to represent people. That's my, that's my recommendation. So I'm going to stop doing this. I will, I will say once again, there are some wonderful consultants out there. I know who they are. I practice with them. I have unbelievable respect for them. They're as good as any lawyer out there, but there are so many that are not. 
I'm going to speak from my heart. I'm going to tell you exactly what I see. And that's what's happening. Okay. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. So no, <laughs> no, you do not need to upload all your previous ones. No, you don't. All right. Okay. We've got score cutoffs. Um, let's see here. Okay. This person says, I've got a travel agency in Delhi and I want to apply for owner operator program for travel agency. Is it a good time to apply for the same right now? Great question. I was just on a call just a couple of weeks ago. Well, a week ago, I guess it was with immigration where they informed us that the owner operator program, they're going to be, they're going to be completely shutting it down. So uh, Jaya, there are other options. There's intercompany transfers. They're setting up startup companies, things like that. There's entrepreneur programs with the various PNPs. And I will encourage you guys, I'm going to share a little bit here. First, I'm going to turn off the comment. Then I'm going to go to my website. Then I'm going to show you guys, I'll just click on here and then I'm going to open up this. Hopefully it's uh, oh, my computer says, Mark, you're asking me to too many, to, to do too many things. Okay. It's thinking. I won't, I won't make it think any, any longer. We'll wait till it slows down. I'm going to go back here. Um, the reality is go to my Canadian immigration podcast. I did an amazing interview with Jeffrey Lowe, an immigration lawyer in British Columbia that talks all about the business immigration options, especially for people just like you. And it decides the website decides to come up. Now go here, search for Canadian immigration podcast right there. And you will see, I'm completing a special series on immigration hearings and appeals with Rekha McNutt. Awesome episodes there. Trump's restrictions on foreign workers really benefit Canada. IELTS, is it really better than the cell PIP? You guys didn't even know this existed, did you? No, you guys are all visual people. Well, if you're traveling to work and you're commuting, get your iPhone, get whatever, go to iTunes, go to Spotify and, and subscribe to this. Is the Canada Border Service Agency above the law? And then here they are with Jeffrey Lowe, Canadian Business Immigration Part 2 and Part 1. Go check these out. There is a ton of information that helps to demystify the whole area that we're talking about here when it comes to coming as a, a company um, owner that is looking to expand. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, BG, this is a good question. Okay. I'm filling out my EAPR as an FSW. Will my personal history seem fraudulent if I mention that I was working full-time at a company A, full-time studies, and part-time at company B? Okay. This is borderline, borderline this because there's a lot more information in here. But what I want to tell you is that there is no problem with working and studying overseas at the same time, full time, and claiming points for both, okay? There's this misconception that you can't study and work, otherwise immigration is gonna reject it. The law does not allow for that. If you've actually worked those hours, a minimum of 30, if you've actually been attending school the way that you've said, you've been paid, you've been working continuously, that work experience can count. And so there's a misconception that somehow if you're doing both, immigration is going to say, well, how can you do both? My goodness, how many of myself, my friends worked full time while we were going to school? You have to do that sometimes to put yourself through, don't you? And so to say, oh no, that's going to be fraudulent. No, if you have questions, use the letter of explanation. That is the magic tool to make everything better. Explain why, explain your situation. Okay. Let's jump down here. Okay, Trisha, Tricia says, hey Mark, any idea how would PNPs meet their immigration targets for 2020 given the fact that the nominations are paused at the moment? Is there a chance still for the PNPs to open up? Understand, the provincial nominee programs are freaked out right now. Like, big shout out to the OINP who extended this special notification of interest. Big shout out. But other provinces like Alberta where the unemployment rates are super high, they're freaked out and they do not want to extend a whole bunch of nominations just from an optic standpoint. In other words, how it looks to Alberta residents, you're issuing all of these nominations and I can't get a job. Well, it depends on the province, but Alberta has announced that they're going to be scaling back. So if the federal government has issued a certain number of, of nominations, they've allocated them, allocated them to the provinces and under our annual levels plan, if they say so many of these are dedicated to the provincial nominee programs, then those nominations are often traded. So if a one province doesn't use them, 
the federal government will take them back and they have the potential to then push them out to another province that is still nominating people. So a little factoid, probably most of you, probably most of you didn't, weren't aware of. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, this person says, hey, does a file still proceed without biometrics being submitted? In Canada, biometrics is being waived right now. And there's, it's always changing. You could watch this video tomorrow. This may not be current. But at this stage, in Canada, it has been waived. Um, but overseas, it's not. It's still an important part of the process. And they're not outright waiving. In some cases, the biometrics can be done by the border officers. But they are not really interested in opening that up to everybody. So it is possible to have biometrics completed at the port of entry when you fly in. And for some agricultural workers, especially the seasonal agricultural worker program, when we really wanted those workers here to continue working in the fields and all of that, then the border officers did the biometrics right at the ports of entry. Another little interesting factoid. Bet you didn't know that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Adiamo uh, says, hey, thanks, Mark, for the information you're giving. It's informative. Good. I'm glad. Hello, Yasin. All right, let's zip through these here. Uh, John's watching up in Edmonton. Great to have you. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Look at this. Sabia says August the 14th. Maybe today is August the 14th. <laughs> that was, you can see how these comments are delayed and it takes me a while to get up to them. And I know I'm talking really fast today and I probably should slow it down, but uh, I'm trying to get through and make this as helpful for you guys as I possibly can. Oh, this Facebook user is from Angola, a nice Portuguese-speaking country. One of my best friends, Piedad Casuaca, he was from Luanda, and I lost touch with him when I was serving a mission in Portugal. If you know Facebook user Piedad, who spent time in Portugal, who is from Luanda, um, tell him I'm here because he is just an unbelievable um, friend, and I lost touch with him. It's been probably... You know what? It's probably been 20 years since I last talked to him. So, whew, that's so awesome. Hello from you. Great to have you joining. Oh, Mina says August the 13th. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's the 13th. <laughs> now I'm all confused. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Hesham, there isn't any update, my friend. The spouses are just stalled out. Just like I talked about with the paper applications, we're just in this limbo period. They're scanning them in and officers are trying to start processing them. We are seeing some movement with spousals. And I shouldn't say that there's no movement because we are. Um, now some of us are seeing uh, work permit confirmations that, you know, that they're going to be issued. So we are seeing some movement, some slow movement. Okay. Um, Amna says, hey, what is in process change to application received? What does it mean? I'll be honest, Amna, I have no clue about that one. I need to actually look at it and see at what stage you were. Sometimes GCMS is a mystery to me even, trying to sort it out. Okay. Um, Okay, so here's a good question. B Biggie, I'll give you another one here. Travel history, EAPR. Even though this one is kind of, once again, borderline, I'm going to talk in generalities. So you can see here, I've traveled in Europe. I've gone to lots of countries, no stamps. Um, should I mention only the country entrance in Europe? <clears throat> I enter everyone. Sometimes, though, it doesn't fit in the APR. So I'll attach in a letter of explanation a detailed chart breaking down all the trips, all the countries that I visited, and there's a number of different kind of tricks and strategies. But um, sometimes if you're in one country, you can then indicate different cities maybe that you that you visited. But when it comes to the whole Europe and the Schengen area, um, you are, uh, I usually will use a letter of explanation to clarify that stuff. Okay, good question. All right. Um, okay, this is a great question. Burke says, this really sucks. He didn't say that, but I know this is what he's thinking. IRCC recently announced that COPR holders whom approved after March 18th and traveling from the U.S. can now enter Canada. Why only the U.S.? Don't you think it's unfair? Heck yeah, I do. I think it's super unfair. I'm with you, Burke. You know, the U.S. has done a terrible job of managing the, 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 the spread of COVID, but they are Canada's largest trading partner. Do you know the political ramifications what it would be if Canada said, you know what, we're closing the border to Americans and we're just going to accept people from countries who are actually taking care of their COVID infections. Do you know what that would do politically? They're our largest trading partner. We rely heavily on the food supply networks that come 
Truckers move back and forth. We have longstanding relationships with the U.S. It's political, dude. It's political. But understand, they're stuck. There's not much more that you can do. So yes, they open it up for people in the U.S. And yes, it sucks. And why they do it, you know, ultimately, I'm not exactly sure. But um, but yeah, it is unfair. And I'll, I'll acknowledge that. Okay, let's see here. We'll find it. Uh, <laughs> Ralph says, there's nice, good hope for people. Yes, there are. Okay, I'm going to zip through this some more. And I want to apologize for people. If I'm missing you, I want to skim and make sure that I'm catching everybody and giving everybody a chance. Those that have tuned in a little bit later, I want to give you guys a chance to, to get your questions answered. There's a really good group of people coming in here. Um, okay. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just drop this one. And really this one, Yasin, I'm going to do that and I'm going to encourage you to book a consult. But everybody needs to understand that on um, when you have a, a COPR that's expiring or a permanent resident visa as well that is expiring and you just can't travel in time, um, you can always notify IRCC that you can't. Then what they do is even though your visa has expired and technically you can't travel unless you're from the U.S. or traveling from the U.S., um, uh, then they will keep it open. And right now it's kind of 90 days and then they revisit it. So there is a mechanism mechanism in place if you can't travel. Once again, this is why Canada is so awesome. They are making accommodations uh, so that you, Yasin, are not um, prejudiced because of this crazy pandemic. All right, good question. Good question. All right, um, let's see here. Some people ask questions like, oh, what about my position? Can I immigrate? Well, those ones, guys, are ones that, that always will get this little bell. And what that little, ringing that little bell means is that that's something that would constitute legal advice. And as an immigration lawyer, um, I give freely all of the inf immigration information that I have. And you can see I don't hold anything back. But when it comes to your specific situation, your unique facts, your unique circumstances, I'm not able to give you advice on what the options are. What would it be like if I did that? If I said, oh, someone asked some question, hey, Mark, can I qualify for the New Brunswick um, PNP? And I said, oh, yeah. And they give me their work history and they give me um, their education history and their age. And they say, hey, here's my NOT code. Do I qualify? And I say, yeah, you qualify. Look, your NOT code is lined right up with ones that they're looking for. And then what I don't know is that that person has a criminal conviction from abroad or they've been previously removed from Canada or they have some other issue that if I had known, the answer would have been no, you don't qualify. That is why I have to be so careful with how I'm answering questions. Now, with that being said, I can easily identify pretty quickly what's legal advice, which is me advising you individually that doesn't really benefit anyone else versus giving general information. Okay, let's keep cruising here. We're going to zip through a bunch. And like I said, I'm sorry if I haven't caught, gotten to your question here. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. Uh, okay, this person says, can we apply for an SOPW now or we should wait? I think that is a spousal open work permit, I think is what this person is trying to say. Absolutely. I continue applying. Just because things aren't moving forward as fast as I would like, I keep applying. Okay, Manpreet says, hey, is working in a father's business considered as work experience if the salary is paid in a bank account? Manpreet, there's nothing saying you can't work in a family business, but you have a higher standard, a higher threshold of proving that you actually did the job. I know sometimes when my kids work in my, in my office and they're helping to scan documents or maybe they're helping to update, update a video in, on YouTube for me, um, they may think they're working full time, but the reality is they're coming in and out. You know, they, they're going off, you know, some days they have something come up with their friends. Is their work really continuous? Are they really working 30 hours a week? That's what it comes down to. Okay, here's a good question. Saksham says, hey, I'm a lawyer in India working on a contract basis or retainer basis with a law firm. Will this constitute self-employment? 
That's something that I can't, this is a perfect example, my friend, right here where I'm gonna ring the bell, perfect. Because there are so many background things that you need to tell me to describe the actual work relationship that will determine whether or not you'd be considered self-employed or employed. Just because someone is paying you on a retainer basis um, doesn't mean that um, it's necessarily self-employed. Now, in many cases it probably is, but that's not something that I can confirm with you unless I get a whole lot more information. At least a lot more that can happen in the comment section on the live YouTube, YouTube stream. Okay, let's see who else we have here. Wow, the questions are coming in so fast. Um, okay, let's see here. And I'm trying not to be selective. Um, word about soft landings, please. Okay, if we can't do a permanent landing and the COPR expired, what will happen? What are before March 18th COPR? So like I said, Mahanad, there is a way for you to notify them that you can't travel. So when it comes to coming and doing soft landings, the, the quarantine requirements make it extremely difficult. Yes, we've heard of people from the U.S. driving up, being able to do a soft landing, turning around and going back. Yes, I've heard that. And it may be possible, excuse me, to convince an officer at the port of entry that that is your intention. But understand, if you're flying into Canada, it's not a situation where you're in your vehicle and you just turn around and you have very limited contact with anyone. If you're flying in, Flights don't just automatically turn around and go back. So where are you going to go in between? And that's where the, um, the requirements to, to actually self-isolate and quarantine yourself often trump these soft landings. But if your COPR is expiring, notify IRCC right away. Let them know that you're not able to travel and they will hold it. Okay? All right. Okay, this is great. Tahir says, your team didn't reply my emails. Tahir, my team always, always reply. But the question is, how long? So our main focus with our lead response times is to get back to you within 24 hours. So hopefully, we're still within that time period. Tahir, if for whatever reason, it slipped through the cracks, understand you may have sent it to the wrong email address. That's why it's so important if you're sending an email, we, I really don't like to get consult requests by email. If you go to the website, you won't see an email address there. You won't see a phone number. Why? Because we get so many inquiries, it will get lost just like you. That's why when you, and I'll just pull you off and we're just going to wrap up here in a second. That's why when I am working off of here, that's why we have this right here, the consult form. Because when it goes into here, it, it will go directly into our intake process and it's locked in and won't get lost. So that's what I'd encourage you to do. Go to the Healthy Immigration Law site and, and fill in the contact form and we will most definitely respond to you. That's how the intake process has to work because of the high number of people that reach out to our firm. Okay. Um, okay. Watching the foreign exchange rate, can I use the calculate my proof of funds Google? Um, use the Bank of Canada exchange rates if they have them, okay? That's what I recommend for that. Okay, let's see. We'll go for one more here. Okay, um, Manushi, same thing right here. I, would, I am delighted to work with all of you. In fact, it's my passion. Express entry, those looking to immigrate, that's the thing I love to do more than anything. In fact, I've got another one coming up just this afternoon. And uh, in spite of everything else, all the consults, I'm gonna meet with Mauricia, my, my intake person, to go over a few things in a few minutes here, right when this is done. Uh, but for all of you out there who um, would like me to work with you, I collaborate with my clients. I don't be a big brother and say, give me your stuff, I'll submit it, and I'll tell you when it's filed. No. For me, I say, Manushi, you and I are a team. We're going to work together. We're going to do a screen share. You're going to start your application in your own MyCIC because you deserve the right to control your application, but you also deserve the right to work with an immigration lawyer. And so, by the system I've set up, you do your share of the work, then I come in and help you with those areas that are absolutely critical. And what are they? Well, for Express Entry, it's everything. We go through all of your profile, all of your EAPR. We have a SharePoint folder. We share documents with our clients. 
you upload all of those there and then we go through everything and I even help to upload the documents to make sure they're all correct. That's the service I offer. So go to the Healthy Law Firm website, click on the start here button and enter your information and Manushi will get you set up right away. Igor will be firing off that intake to you before you even know what hits you or Mauricia, depending upon who's picking up the slack. All right. Okay, guys, I'm going to finish with that. Thank you so much. The end of every video I do, and this is so cool. I love nothing more than to see, Mark, you have a new subscriber to the Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Course to Doing It Yourself. This is where, at the end of every video, I take you right here, and I'm going to share my screen with you right here, website. I'm going to share CanadianImmigrationInstitute.com. I guess I better get it on the actual YouTube page. It will come up right here. One thing I want to tell you about, the Canadian Immigration Institute is what makes this all possible. If it wasn't for this, I wouldn't be able to do this. I, wouldn't have ever got, I would never have even had the opportunity to get started. But because of this, this time, this allows me to do this. And so I created this to help all those people who are DIYers at heart, who really want to take a crack at it themselves. But these are uncertain times, and I don't want any of you guys wasting your money hiring an agent. Don't hire a consultant. Don't hire an overseas agent. Don't hire an immigration lawyer until you've gone here to this site. You have gone to the, the button that says see our courses. You've opened it up and you have tried for free the first two modules of this course. Why? Because in those two modules, when you enter your email address, you log in, you sign up for free, you will learn how Express Entry really works. You will be able to determine whether or not you should even start the process at all. You don't need to hire a lawyer. You do not need to hire a consultant, anyone like that, to take your money and submit a profile when you have no chance of getting the invitation to apply. It serves no purpose. So go here. Those of you who then do that, I'm going to backtrack here. After you've done that, you're going to go to purchase now. Yes, there's an option where you can access it for a month, 97 US, but this is by far the best deal I can offer. And it is simply a caps locked EE, I guess I already had them locked, EE, that's weird, my caps lock doesn't appear to be working, EE DIY, well, sort of, <laughs> we'll get this fixed, you guys can see it there, okay, do I have three E's, oh, that's why I've got three E's, so it's EE DIY 50, and when you punch it in, voila, you get 50% off, $248.50 US, how much are you paying a lawyer or a consultant to assess your eligibility? This will not only show you if you're eligible. Well, the one for free is going to show you if you're eligible. But this walks you through step by step every aspect on how to complete the profile and how to complete the EAPR after your ITA. But the interesting thing is lots of people who purchase this still choose to hire us to give a full review of their application for full peace of mind before they submit it. So there you go. There's the plug. I save it for the end for all of you people that are sticking around, watching to the end, wondering what Mark's got up his sleeve. And I'm going to finish with one last massive thing by flipping back to my screen again. Let's see if I can find this here. I am going to go to my channel. And I'm going to share my website with you. I'm going to close off my beautiful analytics that are a part of this. I have discovered something super, super awesome, cool. If you look at all of my videos in my channel now, you'll see that I've organized things into proper playlists. I've also looked to see my videos and what they do. The last video I did, meeting Alicia, my new lawyer, fantastic. So, so awesome. Each of these videos that I do, these lives, are just full of unbelievable content but they're an hour long. And when you have a video that's an hour long that answers everything all over the board, it makes it impossible for people to search. But guess what happens when you do a small little video that's targeted, that's easy for people to watch? Guess, guess what happens? Well, look at this one, Express Entry, tip number one essential documents. I did this three years ago, I just looked at it and it's still completely relevant. It's awesome. And there's a reason it has 93,000 views. It's because it 
totally goes over the essential documents. And I didn't even appreciate it. Now, there's some aspects of it that might be a little bit off, but, but generally speaking, it is still as important and valuable as it was back then. And how long is it? 12 minutes. Then I did another one. How do, how, how do you establish proof of funds? 10 minutes. Um, what happens if you can't get a reference letter? That's a super popular one. 43,000 people, okay? So how do you know if your reference letter works? You guys can see what's going on here, right? So I am now on a mission. You're gonna see so many videos being released and I'm gonna be having separate playlists. Canadian Immigration Live, it's here. All the podcast episodes are being released here. Express Entry, there's gonna be ones targeted to Express Entry. I created one, just, I had some spare time for spousals. I created it, uh, how long is it ago? I can't remember, two years ago. It's got 36,000 views. It was a great video. I was announcing this amazing thing. And, and so I realized, and then I can't help it. Now, I share stuff about myself, and that's quite common. I do it quite frequently. But I've created a separate channel called Mark's Out of Office Adventures. And so that is what I'm sharing. So you can go check out that video I did with Joe for people who are interested in what Mark's doing. Obviously, it's tucked down here near the bottom because obviously people are not here to watch about, you know, what Mark's doing in his personal life. But the reality is this channel is me. It is me. And so I've changed it. I made, I removed the, the Canadian Immigration Institute logo. What's the Canadian Immigration Institute? But who is Mark Holthy? That's what this is about. And so I changed my banner image. I changed my little thumbnail, my profile picture, and I'm reorganizing this. And guess what I'm going to be creating? I'm going to be creating playlists for everything, for work permits, for study permits, for visitors, for corporations, trying to figure out how to move their people, for challenges at the border. I'm going to create these little videos from everything, everything you could imagine about immigration. And where is that information coming from? Well, if you go here, live now, the one that's going on right now, you guys have posted so many comments that I never got to today, did I? Nope. So it's not fair to you not to have your question answered. So guess what Mark is gonna do? I'm gonna create a little video that can be put up on the YouTube uh, for 100,000 other people. And this little channel that in the last year, since 2018, 2000, the beginning of 2020, <laughs> It has grown astronomically from about three to 20,000 right now. And that's just from the live videos. But when we start to post all of these little tiny, helpful, super awesome nuggets of inf information, it's gonna just go boom. So stay tuned. Your question might not get answered in the lives, but oh boy, I'm gonna take all of those awesome questions from the lives and create little videos for you. All right. This here is Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, an unapologetic Canadian immigration lawyer, who is proud of who he is, who's proud of his, possession, his profession, who is, oh yeah, I forgot, I've got one other thing I'm gonna do. I am gonna start another playlist. I keep calling these channels, sorry, they're not channels. On the, on the YouTube channel, these are actually playlists. I better get my act together. So these are playlists, get my terminology. I'm gonna be creating one that's called Immigration Nation. And that playlist is gonna be where I invite immigration lawyers on from across the country to share their best knowledge, their best tips, their best um, strategies for navigating immigration at a very, very high level and just highlighting how awesome they are. And like I said, the Canadian Immigration Institute, Holthy Immigration Law, which is my law firm, um, for, with every fiber of my being, my vision, my mission is that every single person deserves the right to be represented by an immigration lawyer. And so do you. Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer. I better get to my big ugly face here. <laughs> Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer and former high school teacher signing off saying thank you so much for listening. And I wish you guys all the best as you navigate this crazy world that we call Canadian immigration. Take care.